morning and good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us today. My name is Peter Rashish. I'm the Vice President and Director of the Geoeconomics Program at the American German Institute. Today, we are delighted to have uh, host this webinar on translating politics into technocracy, the European Banking Union and the Global Perspective, where we'll hear the views of William O'Connell. Um, I think it's fair to say that banking union is a key aspect of the uh, ongoing efforts by the EU to complete its uh, single or internal market, but it's also probably right to say that it's a work in progress, and we will hear all about that today from William. Uh, William is a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. His research there focuses on the politics of international finance, global governance, and the political economy of multinational corporations. Uh, before he uh, began pursuing his PhD, William worked as a policy analyst for the government of Canada, and he's currently with us in Washington as a DAD AGI fellow. Uh, and I think during today's event, we will be um, interested to hear William's views on how um, global financial governance, European political forces and also the technical solutions that are necessary are kind of battling it out in this important area of the banking union. So with that, William, let me hand it over to you. And after that, we'll have a, a conversation. Great, thank you for that uh, introduction, Peter. So I'll uh, pull up my, uh, my slides here. Um, okay, great, uh, yeah, so um, as Peter mentioned, my name is William O'Connell. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto, and I've been here at uh, at AGI for a couple months, um, finishing up some of the uh, the field work before I get into the the writing of my dissertation. So I'll begin with a little bit of context. Um, so my dissertation examines the development of international standards on cross border bank resolutions, and this entails an examination of the history of pre two thousand eight efforts at creating standards at harmonizing bank insolvency laws and the process of formalizing a bank resolution regime after 2008, both at the global level uh, through the Financial Stability Board and then within the EU uh, regarding the banking union. And more broadly, my dissertation aims to understand the extent to which cooperation among technocrats and between regulatory agencies can compensate for or overcome more politicized barriers to international cooperation. And sort of the tension that's created by a financial system which is global in good times and very much not global when things turn sour. So I've wrapped up the field work for my dissertation and I'm now working out the uh, the writing portion. And this field work has entailed um, a bit over, a few over 40 interviews with financial regulators and some private sector officials in the US and Western Europe, as well as archival work at the International Monetary Fund, the Bank for International Settlements and the Bank of France. And I'll be touching on some of this broader work that I mentioned um, for additional context. But today's presentation, uh, as Peter mentioned, is going to focus on the European component of, uh, of my research. So the plan for today is that I'll start with some brief historical context on how regulators have addressed moral hazard in the past 50 or so years. And then I'll move on to lay out um, cross-border bank resolutions as a policy problem. And I'll discuss how this has been addressed through the global soft law um, standard setting that's, that's typical financial regulation. And then I'm going to focus in on how those global standards have been implemented in uh, the European Union through the banking union, which has gradually developed over the last 10 years or so. And then I'm going to zoom back out and discuss some of the implications of this um, for EU and global financial governance. So the story here really begins in 1974. Uh, Frankfurt-based Bankhaus Hörstadt fails, and this forces regulators to confront a problem that had been created by the post Bretton Woods expansion of global banking which is what happens when a large cross-border bank goes bust. And so this problem is the catalyst for the creation of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, but the discussion there very quickly turns to improving regulation. In other words, the early focus of BCBS and global regulatory work was on preventing crises from happening in the first place. Attempts to discuss what to do if a crisis happened anyway were quickly dismissed. And the result is that up until 2008, there was really no meaningful international coordination on bank failures. And in fact, most countries lacked a separate national bankruptcy regime, even for their domestic banks. Now, after 2008, we've done a full 180. So the BCBS and the FSB uh, Financial Stability Board publish a joint list of globally systemically important banks, dubbed GSIBs, 
And these are subject to tighter regulation. They're subject to mandatory bail-ins. I'll explain what this is in a moment. Uh, and mandatory cross-border resolution planning. In other words, these banks are explicitly designated uh, as being too big to fail, at least in the traditional sense of, uh, of what we would think of there. And more specifically, most G20 countries have clarified in quite explicit terms how they would intervene in a bank failure, with some, like the United Kingdom, going so far as to pre-specify the terms of a fiscal guarantee and publishing assessments of the resolvability of individual banks. Before 2008, this would have been considered a lunacy, to, to put it mildly. You would have been laughed out of Basel if you had suggested uh, doing this, but it's now the norm. Um, and so we have a completely separate national insolvency procedure, um, an international insolvency procedure rather, for dealing with banks. And cross-border bank resolutions have gone from sort of a niche curiosity into a sophisticated and transnational policy science in a very short span of time. So this is the most recent list of uh, GSIBs. It was published in November um, of last year. Obviously, it's already out of date uh, since Credit Suisse has now been, uh, been merged with UBS. And I've highlighted the, uh, the European headquartered uh, GSIBs here. So there's eight of them. There are four uh, headquartered in France. So BNP Paribas, uh, Group BPCE, Petit Agricole, and Société Générale. And then uh, we have one each in uh, Germany, Spain, Italy, and the Netherlands. So let's suppose one of these uh, institutions fails. What do you do? Well, there are essentially four options. One is a general corporate bankruptcy. And this might seem the most obvious, right? After all, we live in a capitalist society and weak businesses are supposed to fail. But this process is wholly inappropriate for large banks, given the critical functions that they play in society. And as a result, uh, putting a large bank through a general uh, insolvency, and we saw this with Lehman Brothers in 2008, it's a disaster. It creates a chaotic breakdown of not just the banking system, but it creates these big spillovers into the broader economy. It induces recessions and it destroys a ton of value. So another option then is a bailout, right? We're all familiar with this. You socialize losses and the problem hopefully just goes away on its own. But obviously, this is a perversion, um, again, of these kind of founding principles of, uh, of society. And more importantly, it's unfair, right? It's unjust, it's morally distasteful, and it's incredibly unpopular. And in the long run, it creates financial instability, right? Because if banks assume that they'll be bailed out, then they're incentivized to take a ton of risks. Uh, and we learned this lesson in 2008 as well. Option three is an arranged marriage. Uh, this is essentially forcing a merger with a stable bank. And this does tend to fix the problem, usually, uh, but typically it requires the taxpayers to sort of grease the wheel in order to get a deal done. And of course, it shrinks competition in the banking system. Uh, so in Switzerland, for example, uh, as I mentioned, they merged Credit Suisse with UBS, and that solved that crisis uh, for now. But in the process, they've created a monster, right? They only have one bank, really, in their entire banking system, and that's an untenable problem that they'll have to deal with. So option four is what we've come up with after 2008. This is resolution. And I'll get into some of the details in a moment here, but for now, it's important to think of resolution as being sort of a new form of bankruptcy, which both preserves the critical functions that banks uh, play to avoid a general panic, while also avoiding a taxpayer bailout. And doing this is immensely complicated. Um, frankly, even among financial regulators, this is a subject that's seen as arcane and technical. And it also requires a higher degree of international cooperation than options one uh, through three. So how do we establish a resolution regime? Well, one option is an international treaty, uh, which could establish sort of a legally binding global bankruptcy court, but that seemed untenable from the beginning. Another option, uh, and this might seem the most obvious option perhaps, is breaking up the banks, right? Because then we don't have to deal with this problem in the first place. But that also similarly was, uh, was viewed as untenable. And so the result is that uh, we need to construct a resolution regime which, um, which is sensitive to the fact that international banks are global in life, but national in death. And this is a term coined by uh, former Bank of England Governor uh, Mervyn King. And this involves overcoming a number of technical and political challenges. So on the technical side, we need to deal with the fact that countries have very different laws for dealing with bank failures, both in the sense that they vary country by country, but also in the sense that it varies whether those laws are different for banks than they are for other types of firms. 
We need to deal with information asymmetry because countries might have different degrees of information about their own banks and certainly have different degrees of information about each other's banks. Uh, and you know, firms have to actually be resolvable. So pre-2008, many GSIBs had such convoluted corporate structures that even their own risk managers didn't understand how all the pieces fit together. And this precludes any meaningful degree of intervention. And finally, there need to, needs to be some mechanism for ensuring that losses are absorbed by creditors and not by taxpayers. But this isn't enough. There are also political challenges here. So countries need to resist the temptation to ring fence assets in the domestic subsidiaries of foreign banks and to allow their, uh, their domestic banks to provide capital and liquidity to foreign subsidiaries uh, if necessary. There also need to be mechanisms for burden sharing because frankly, it's inevitable that some amount of public money is gonna to need to be put up to resolve one of these large banks. Even if it's collateralized, it'll be recuperated. Even if it's only a backstop, um, some amount is gonna be necessary. And countries need legal mechanisms to recognize and comply with resolution decisions that are taken abroad. And officials need to accept the termination of their possible national champions. Uh, and that may entail a loss of prestige. And then finally, even if taxpayers aren't the ones on the hook for losses, somebody is gonna be holding the bag. And the question of who that person will be is inherently political. So in order to solve these problems, we need credible commitments on the terms of intervention. And this credibility has two conditions, right? It requires the technical ability to resolve a bank, right? This means statutory powers, it means tools, it means policy expertise, but we also need the political willingness to actually implement these powers, tools, and expertise when it's necessary. But the soft law standard setting process that's sort of typical of global financial regulation is really only suited to address the former problem and not the latter one. So these problems were first addressed at the global level. So in 2009, uh, the G20 assigns the Financial Stability Board with crafting uh, international standards for a bank resolution regime. And this culminated in the key attributes of effective resolution regimes for financial institutions, uh, which was finalized in 2011 and has been periodically updated since. And the key attributes have been implemented in basically every major jurisdiction. But the FSB is a technocratic body. It's not a forum of finance ministers and diplomats negotiating a treaty. And accordingly, it's only really suited to addressing the technical challenges that are on the left side here. And it's, it's done so. Uh, so we have harmonized bank insolvency laws, at least for the largest banks. Uh, we have so-called crisis management groups, which are firm-specific committees of regulators across major jurisdictions. And they do contingency planning and also work with the banks to ensure that they're structured in a way that makes resolution uh, feasible. And they've made a substantial amount of progress in this respect. And then, of course, we have the bail-in mechanism. Uh, and so with this mechanism, the largest banks are required to issue a certain portion of capital, uh, which might be converted into equity or simply wiped out in a crisis at the discretion of the regulators. And this ensures that it's creditors and not taxpayers who absorb the bulk of losses in a failure. But where the standard setting process has failed is on the political challenges that are on the right side here. So on burden sharing and mutual recognition, the key attributes establish norms, but they don't establish requirements. Essentially, countries have removed mandates to ring fence assets, and they allow for the legal possibility to recognize foreign action, but none of this is compelled. And accordingly, uh, there's no longer a legal obligation to be uncooperative, which was a problem in 2008, but there are still incentives to be uncooperative. And these final two problems are probably unsolvable, right? Politicians are always gonna be incentivized to bail out their large you know, national champions and decisions over who suffers losses in a crisis are necessarily going to be contentious. So this is not to say that these reforms were all for naught. Um, for one, simply making an orderly resolution a legal possibility is itself very important, right? Pre-2008, this wasn't even possible. But beyond that, regulators have made a lot of progress by translating some of these political challenges into technical puzzles. And what I mean by that is that bureaucrats in resolution agencies view their jobs as attempting to identify and remove barriers to an orderly resolution before those issues become politically salient. Essentially, the goal here is to make cooperation the cheapest and most efficient option when a crisis occurs. And it's important to note that this is a shared goal between the regulators and the banks themselves. So obviously, a bank would prefer a bailout, 
But in the absence of a bailout, an orderly wind down at the group level preserves much more value than a messy corporate insolvency or even a, a merger generally for that matter. And um, so I'm, I'm gonna bracket the rest of the private sector uh, discussion for, uh, for today, but I'm happy to talk about this in the Q and A because it is critically important. And now this last comment might, uh, might look like a joke, but my interviewees were actually deadly serious about this point. Um, so many of the Germans that I interviewed, uh, they referenced Clausewitz, this idea that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And most of the Americans I spoke to expressed a similar sentiment, but of course they quoted Mike Tyson, right? That nobody, uh, that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, and the point being the substance of contingency planning is much less important than the discipline of planning. So regulators now know their counterparts in other jurisdictions on a personal level. In many cases, they're friends, and this didn't exist in 2008. But this, um, this friendship, these regular meetings, uh, this fosters trust between individuals and ensures that regulators know about and are sympathetic to the constraints that their counterparts are working under. And this is absolutely critical for ensuring cooperation uh, during a crisis. So that's the global picture. I'm not gonna spend too much time giving a background on how 2008 kind of manifested in Europe, but needless to say, there were a cascade of bank failures and later a wave of sovereign debt crises that have shaped EU politics in the last 15 or so years since. And these banking crises eventually culminated in sovereign debt crisis, and that led to what has been called the bank sovereign doom loop. Uh, and this essentially means that for many of these Southern European governments that I have uh, listed there, bank failures led to government bailouts, which in turn um, balloon sovereign debt, that devalues those countries' bond markets, that weakens the banking system, requires future bailouts, and you have this sort of death spiral where you get uh, countries with chronically weak banks and chronically large uh, budget deficits. But addressing this problem is hampered by the structure of the European Union and specifically the Eurozone. Uh, so this isn't new information, obviously, but for our purposes, the mismatch between a single European market and national fiscal authority has very serious implications for the efficacy of a resolution. So at the highest level, a common currency with national fiscal authority creates a sort of de facto debt mutualization, which then creates a, an ambiguity during a crisis because things get messy if what the market expects is disconnected from what national politicians are willing to accept. And we saw this in the Greek bailout fiasco, right? The Germans tried and eventually failed to credibly commit to not bailing out the Greek government. And in the wake of doing that, clearly no one expects the Euro to break apart and no one wants the Euro to break apart. And that means that member states are on the hook for each other's losses, whether they're willing to admit it or not. But refusing to admit it limits flexibility in a crisis because it means that state aid becomes tied to rigorous, rigid, quantitative, and highly bureaucratic rules and procedures that may not be appropriate for the problem at hand. And I'll get to this problem in more detail in a moment here. A slightly narrower problem is the mismatch between having common financial markets and having national deposit insurance. So given that there's no barriers to moving money across EU states, having different levels of protection can create a serious vulnerability to runs in a crisis as depositors flee from banks headquartered in places with less generous insurance to places with more generous insurance. And we saw this uh, quite a bit in 2000, uh, 2008. And it also limits the pool of money available to finance a resolution. And even narrower, but still, uh, still quite important, is the problem of having pan-European banks with national resolution procedures. And so there's now an EU-wide resolution regime, but it's hampered by distrust in the shadow of 2008. Uh, and it still relies on national implementation, which creates a tendency towards bailouts. So in response to some of these problems, member states agreed to strengthen their financial integration via the banking union. And this project began around 2012 and has been implemented since around 2014. And there were originally three pillars that were envisioned here. There was the single supervisory mechanism to unify bank regulation, and that's now in place and, and functions relatively well. Then there's the single resolution mechanism, and this entails uh, harmonizing national uh, resolution schemes within the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive, and also the establishment of the single resolution board, which is a resolution authority at the European level for the largest EU banks. And I'm gonna talk about some of the problems that uh, exist within the SRM here. And then the final pillar is the European deposit insurance scheme. So this is absolutely critical for a resolution to have unified deposit insurance 
Uh, but it was dead on arrival. Uh, no serious progress has been made on this um, since it's been implemented. And in fact, very little progress has been made on even harmonizing national deposit insurance schemes. And this is a huge problem. So as with any issue of European integration, there are sort of five main axes of contestation. And which one of these uh, five axes are most important tends to vary by issue area. For our purposes, these first three are the most important, right? So we have Germany and France. Typically, when the Germans and the French agree on something, then EU integration often moves forward. Uh, we have conflict, especially in the wake of the crisis, conflict between Northern Europe and Southern Europe. Uh, and we have conflict between large member states and small member states. In the context of resolution, this is referred to as the home host problem. Uh, so you have the home countries of the large banks, and then you have host countries, which are dominated by subsidiaries of those banks. And then you also have Eastern Europe versus Western Europe. This tends to be most salient around issues of security, um, but uh, for our purposes, this is mainly subsumed by, uh, by the other axes. And then of course you have Eurozone countries versus non-Eurozone countries. And this is relevant here, but it's much less relevant um, in the wake of Brexit, right? Because now all of the main large EU banks are uh, headquartered in Eurozone countries. So I'm gonna leave out this discussion uh, for today. So as with all issues um, on EU integration, the banking union and the resolution elements of it were established in the shadow of uh, conflicting preferences between Germany and France. But in this case, those differences are very intractable and they're a function of having almost polar opposite uh, banking system structures. So French banking is very concentrated and that's evidenced by having four GSIBs, uh, all of which are hugely internationalized. Germany, by contrast, has Deutsche Bank as its one GSIB. Uh, there's Commerzbank, which is large, but not anywhere near the GSIB threshold. And then it's mostly dominated by local um, credit unions and the uh, Sparkassen savings banks. And these sort of quasi-public entities are really deeply entwined with local uh, launder and federal politicians. Reflecting this on deposit insurance, uh, in France, they have sort of a familiar system with a single publicly owned deposit insurance entity. But in Germany, there are multiple public, private, and sort of quasi-private systems that govern different types of institutions and include institutional protection schemes, which are insurance mechanisms for firms uh, against their own failure, uh, which by extension protects deposits. But this system has created a situation where Germany's deposit insurance system is very well funded, is not really fully under government control, and has a highly idiosyncratic structure uh, relative not just to the rest of Europe, but relative to, to the rest of the world, frankly. And uh, so this last point is important to note. Uh, so in France, in practice, there's very little separation between the banks and the state. Uh, and accordingly, there's a fairly low aversion to bailouts, uh, at least among French regulators and the French governing elite. Uh, and France, accordingly, has generally been relatively reluctant uh, participant in the post of the reform agenda on, uh, on banking. Germany, by contrast, we would typically think of as being fixated on moral hazard, sometimes to its detriment, as we saw in the, uh, in the Greek situation. But this perception isn't quite accurate, or at least it's more nuanced in practice. Um, so ideologically, successive German governments have been very hardline about ending too weak to fail, about ending this reflex towards bailouts, uh, but not in Germany, uh, because just like the big French banks, the local uh, Sparkassen, these local savings banks, are very close with their local politicians. And the result is that in most elements of the banking union, Germany has been insistent that these local institutions be exempted, uh, and resolution is no exception here. So the second axis is the north-south divide. Um, so you have Germany along with the Netherlands, Belgium, Finland, and some others that have sort of divergent preferences and structures compared to Spain, Italy, Greece, Portugal, you know, the countries that got into serious fiscal trouble in the crisis uh, and are suffering from the so-called bank sovereign doom loop that I mentioned earlier. So these southern countries um, have weaker banks, they have weaker government balance sheets, uh, and there's also a perception of these governments being more amenable to bailouts, uh, in part because they did bail out their banks um, in 2008 uh, and got into trouble for it. And Italy, of course, tends to be the biggest reference point here uh, because they have bailed out several banks since these uh, rules came into place uh, after the crisis. And consequently, these states tend to have less well-funded deposit insurance schemes than Northern Europe, 
And cooperation here quickly becomes hampered by a perception that Southern banks are more weakly regulated. And the extent to which this is actually the case after the crisis uh, is debatable, right? For one, supervision is now at the EU level and everyone has the same rule book. And of course, everyone always thinks that their regulation is great until the next crisis proves them wrong. And as a result, often discussions about harmonizing deposit insurance or other burden sharing initiatives, uh, at least in Germany, they very quickly descend from nuanced discussions about bank regulation into sort of crude national stereotypes about prudent German savers being expected to bail out lazy Italians. Um, the discourse tends to degrade quite quickly uh, on this issue. And then we have the large small divide, right? The home host problem. And here the GSIB home authorities, again, Germany, France, the Netherlands, Spain, and Italy, have banking systems that have relatively little foreign bank penetration and have relatively large fiscal capacity. And conversely, many small European countries are totally dominated by foreign bank subsidiaries, and this gives them substantially less control over both regulation as well as resolution decision making, and it leaves them vulnerable to the whims of home state governments in a crisis. And this was especially the case for Belgium uh, in, uh, in 2008, where several of their cross-border banks um, failed, and they were sort of left out uh, on their own by, uh, by their neighboring governments. And... So it's especially important here to consider um, this problem given uh, the asymmetric risk that this puts uh, host states in. So to give you an example of what I mean by asymmetric risk, let's consider Banco Santander. So Santander is a GSIB based in Spain, but with considerable global operations, particularly in Latin America. The Portuguese subsidiary of Santander accounts for only about 3% of the group's assets. Oops, sorry. 3% uh, of the group's assets, and the Portuguese operations are the seventh largest internationally behind Spain, the US, the UK, Brazil, Mexico, and Chile. But conversely, Santander is the third largest bank in Portugal, and it accounts for about 13% of assets in the Portuguese banking system. So this is a pretty extreme asymmetry, right? Portugal is probably not systemically important for Santander, but Santander is clearly systemically important in Portugal. And this situation is perhaps even more extreme when we think of BNP uh, Paribas and its operations in Belgium. So BNP is a French GSIB, and it's one of the largest GSIBs, period. Um, and its subsidiary in, with Fortis, which was a bank that failed in 2008 and was acquired by BNP, um, the Fortis subsidiary of BNP accounts for only about 13% of BNP's assets, but it's nearly a third of the Belgian banking system. And in fact, it's the largest bank in Belgium. So we have a similar issue here. Obviously, Fortis is a little bit more important to BNP uh, than in the last example, but it's clearly much, much more important for the Belgian uh, financial system than it is for BNP Paribas as a group, and especially for, for the French, uh, French financial system. All of which is to say, given these constraints and intractable differences, we wouldn't really have expected any progress here, right? Germany and France are simply structured too differently. The health of Northern and Southern European banks is too different. And following the trauma of 2008, host states are extremely reluctant to trust home states, given the asymmetric risks involved. But the public salience of ending too big to fail and the need to comply with an international standard, which these EU states helped negotiate, uh, necessitated a set of compromises. And so the result in sort of true European fashion is a convoluted decision-making process with multiple veto points. Um, so when a bank gets into trouble, uh, step one is that the ECB and the single resolution board need to decide if the bank is failing or likely to fail, and they need to come to a joint decision on this matter. Then the SRB conducts a public interest assessment to determine whether the bank should be put into a resolution or put under a general corporate insolvency. Following that, there needs to be a resolution plan drafted by the SRB in consultation with the relevant national authorities. This plan then needs to be approved by the European Commission and implicitly also approved by the relevant national authorities. And then if that's approved, then it needs to be approved by the European Council. And finally, the plan needs to be implemented by the national authorities. So this is a lengthy, complex process with a lot of moving parts, a lot of potential for disagreement, many veto points. But this is made more problematic by the reality that most resolutions happen in a weekend, right? So really, you only have the time between Friday afternoon and Monday morning to go through all of these steps uh, in a sort of seamless process. So that's the process, 
In terms of execution, there are several important shortcomings. One is a complete reliance on the bail-in mechanism. Now, a bail-in is essentially a debt for equity swap. In a resolution, the shareholders are wiped out, and then a certain portion of bondholders are converted into shareholders to recapitalize the failing bank. And what's important here, and I'll talk about this on the next slide as well, is that bail-ins only provide capital. They don't provide liquidity, but banks need both to survive. And chances are, if your bank is being bailed in, then the market is not going to provide that liquidity. So in order for banks to survive, somebody has to provide that. Um, and it means that bail-ins are a useful tool in that they allocate losses, but they aren't the only tool that can or should be used, and they don't solve the problem on their own. But under the single resolution mechanism, bail-ins are mandatory before any amount of public money um, or resolution liquidity can be put up. And this, this makes sense, right? Ostensibly, it should reduce moral hazard. It ensures that losses are not borne by the taxpayers. But in reality, in practice, it creates problems in a systemic crisis. If regulators lack the flexibility to pursue other options besides a bail-in as the circumstances may arise. So you could be put in a situation where you have to impose even greater losses on a market that's already uh, in a downward spiral, and that can quickly exacerbate existing problems. And this bail-in capital is pre-positioned among home and host states. And this is more expensive because it just requires more capital generally. And it, while it does somewhat insulate host countries, um, it doesn't totally eliminate uh, that home host problem that I mentioned. And more importantly, it indicates a broader lack of trust. And this is essential, as I mentioned, for ensuring uh, cooperation in a crisis. And in fact, under this system, we've sort of built in a degree of uh, uncooperative behavior. And then more broadly, the single resolution mechanism is only applicable to the largest EU banks. But Europe is home to a large volume of medium-sized regional banks, many of which operate across borders. And these banks are not really large enough to issue a sufficient amount of bail-in capital to work under these rules, but they're also so large that they can't be put through a general corporate insolvency. And so in this case, a bail-in is really the only uh, option, or a bailout, rather, is really the only option for these, uh, for these banks. So a bail-in, as I mentioned, it deals with the solvency problem, but modern bank failures are not about solvency, they're about liquidity. Even banks that are lurching towards insolvency, like uh, Credit Suisse or Silicon Valley Bank, to give some recent examples, these banks are killed by a liquidity shortage long before they reach insolvency. And what this means is that a bank resolution is going to need a source of liquidity, um, a bank in resolution needs a source of liquidity in order to ensure its critical operations are maintained while it's broken up. And there are various ways to deal with this. In the US and UK, there are sort of statutory lines of credit, which the authority can draw upon uh, directly from the treasury. Other countries uh, beef up their deposit insurance funds for this purpose. But in Europe, there's no central fiscal authority, right? There's no European treasury, and there's also no deposit insurance fund. So the single resolution fund um, was created through premiums on EU banks to serve this purpose, but the total amount available is clearly inadequate. 160 billion euros uh, is maybe enough for a single GSIB in an isolated case, but in a systemic crisis, it's almost certainly not gonna be sufficient. And so that gets into this ambiguity problem that I had mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. But where the least amount of progress has been made is on deposit insurance. So here, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, Germany has basically drawn a red line and has consistently refused to cooperate. But more worryingly, there hasn't even really been success on harmonizing national deposit insurance schemes. And this creates some problems. For one, there's the problem of runs that I mentioned earlier, right? You might be incentivized as a depositor to take your money out of a bank headquartered somewhere with a less generous system and put it somewhere that's headquartered uh, in a bank that's headquartered somewhere with a more generous system. But uh, I'm, I'm gonna get a little technical here, but the other uh, serious problem that this creates is having different creditor hierarchy models across Europe. And this can leave authorities open to litigation, right? Because most resolution regimes are governed under a principle that no creditor should be worse off than under a liquidation. But if you have different hierarchies of creditors, then different creditors in different jurisdictions may have a different order of claims of the same institution for the same types of instruments. And this becomes very, very complicated. It can lead to costly long-term litigation. It can break down uh, crisis management proceedings. It can lead to chaotic insolvencies. It can lead to different actions being taken in one country versus another country. 
and all which is to say this probably just incentivizes bailouts to uh, avoid these uh, these problems in the first place. So circling back to our axes of um, contention to uh, to kind of wrap up here, uh, we can see a few outcomes, right? So one, the Franco-German divide led to uh, a total breakdown on deposit insurance with no foreseeable solution, as well as this missing middle problem through the exemption of all but the largest uh, banks in the EU. The North-South divide, meanwhile, also contributed to this breakdown on deposit insurance, as well as other mechanisms for burden sharing like liquidity funding. And it also introduced multiple veto points as member states are sort of unable to trust each other enough to fully delegate responsibility. And the same occurs with the home host problem, right? So banks are segmented along national lines, even among the same banking groups in ways that are expensive and they create additional complexity and ambiguity. And the trauma of 2008 has essentially totally destroyed uh, the trust of small member states that large ones will help them out in a crisis. So as I mentioned in the first part of my presentation, the key attributes of effective resolution regimes essentially transformed a political problem into a technical one. And that created the ability, but not necessarily the willingness to resolve a large cross-border bank. But the EU's fiscal mismatch necessitates a further translation. It requires a less flexible regime with a more limited scope, less available funding, and a complex decision structure with multiple veto points in order to ensure compliance with the key attributes as they're written, but without the necessary fiscal and political integration necessary to actually make resolution work. And the result is that we're here 10 years later uh, and the banking union, uh, the EU rather, has only really achieved one and a half of the three pillars that were originally envisioned under the banking union. But look, as I mentioned, this is not to say that the whole uh, reform project has been a waste of time, uh, quite the opposite, actually. So we've made tremendous progress uh, globally and incremental progress in the EU. So despite the shortcomings that uh, that I just detailed for, for quite a while there, uh, what exists in Europe is undeniably better than the nothing that preceded it. Uh, and this has been made possible by a resigned acceptance among regulators of the inevitability of moral hazard, right? So regulars are no longer ignoring the too big to fail problem or worse, denying that it exists in the first place as we saw before 2008, uh, but instead they've made tenuous commitments to address it and developed a considerable amount of policy capacity in this respect. So we can't be certain that a resolution will actually be executed for a GSIB or that it will be successful even if it is executed, uh, but it's at least conceivable in the legal and technical sense that one could be executed and could be successful even in Europe, at least most of them, and assuming we only have to do one at a time. Uh, so I will uh, end things there. I'll flip it back to, uh, to Peter, and uh, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, uh, William. And uh, let me um, remind everyone, if you'd like to ask a question, please do so with the Q&A uh, button at the, at probably at the bottom of your screen. But we, and we do have some questions coming in. Let me just start with um, two, maybe they're uh, sort of zooming out a bit. Um, <clears throat> one is you said that before 2008, the focus was on uh, how to prevent a crisis. And then afterwards, there was a lot more attention to what to do in case you actually have a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, maybe another way of uh, borrowing from a different field, maybe another way of expressing that is deterrence versus what happens when deterrence fails. So my question would be, is there more that can be done on the deterrence side? Uh, to, to as And it sounds like you just talked a lot about the what happens if, if deterrence fails, or is there more that can be done on the deterrence side? I'm not sure, and I have a second question. I'm not sure it's related, maybe, maybe at least tangentially, and that is, okay, so you described a lot of the particular differences or peculiarities um, sort of uh, within and, and you know, among different na uh, national sort of banking cultures almost in, in, in the EU, right? Um, and, but one thing that sort of, uh, at least certainly I think if, if you look at the, since Brexit, one thing that characterizes the, the EU, I think, generally compared to, let's say, the United States is the fact that it has a very developed banking system and a kind of underdeveloped capital market system, right? So my question would be, if the EU uh, did manage to move towards a capital markets union and a more sophisticated uh, and a, a deeper capital markets um, uh, reality, could that somehow 
takes some of the sting out of the issues that are at, our, at hand when we look at banking, the banking side particularly. So let me throw those two out and then I'll turn it over to some of the questions we've, that have come in. Okay, great. Yeah, so on the first question, I think uh, one of the sort of ironies of focusing this much on resolution, um, and many of the people I spoke to uh, working on this uh, stated this quite clearly, that the goal of having a resolution plan is to never have to use it. And the motivation here is that before 2008, there was this sort of assumption that if you don't clarify what you're going to do in a crisis, then participants have to assume the worst, right? They have to assume that they're going to suffer losses, and then they won't take reckless decisions. And obviously, that didn't work. And so the thinking behind um, resolution planning is that if you specify in advance who is going to suffer losses and how much, then markets can bake in those principles, and they can price that risk, and they won't take unnecessary or mispriced risks. And so this is where the, the bail-in mechanisms come in, right? So you buy these bail-in bonds and you're told in the contracts, if the worst happens, then you're gonna lose your money. And so, you know, some Credit Suisse bondholders are learning that lesson the hard way, right? They bought those bonds and now they're suffering losses. And that's ostensibly the way that this should work. And then if we look at the actual bond spreads on some of these, we can see where we can see the credibility of some of these regimes, right? So for some countries, uh, it's pretty clear from the risk premiums that people think that they will actually be triggered and that a bailout is not going to happen. And in other countries, let's call them Italy, uh, markets don't think that that's going to happen. Um, and so you have uh, these resolution uh, regimes and this planning is intended to impose discipline. And the other way that it, it works is in reducing the complexity of some of these banks. So the process of resolution planning has brought in bank senior management and has essentially forced senior management in these banks to think clearly about how all of the pieces of their institutions fit together and to understand where the, the key kind of risks within their structures lies. And the benefit, um, perhaps a slightly unforeseen benefit of doing this is that it forces senior management to look into redundancy and to really think through whether having these convoluted corporate structures is actually profitable. And in fact, it turns out, especially if you have to draft these costly hundreds of pages resolution plans for the regulators every year, in fact, it actually might be beneficial to streamline your industry, to cut out some riskier portions of business, to reduce the amount of arbitrage that you're engaging in. And that in turn pairs down some amount of risks that these banks are, are taking. Um, so this planning does have kind of spillover effects into the regulatory side, on top of the regulatory um, improvements that have been made after 2008. On the capital markets union question, um, that's an interesting question because there is resolution planning and cooperation within the European Union. And then there's also considerable cooperation between the European Union, the UK, and the US. So there are sort of now bilateral, uh, essentially war games between central bankers, finance ministers, and resolution authorities between these countries where they'll draw up a bank based on a specific institution and they'll play out what will happen in a crisis. And the reason this is probably critical for Europe is that a lot of European banks um, operate you know, as deposit-taking institutions, these universal entities in Europe, but then have considerable investment banking um, and capital markets operations in the US and the UK. And so this, makes those banks to some extent dependent on foreign regulation and dependent on foreign resolution um, activities. Yeah. It creates a lot of cross-border spillovers. So I suppose in that respect, the benefit of a capital markets union and deeper capital market um, functions within the European Union would be to sort of, um, I guess, onshore that activity and to bring that under the purview of European um, regulation. And that might create additional risks perhaps, but it might also at least provide uh, some more information um, for European regulators. So probably that would have positive effects here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, we have a question uh, regarding Germany, um, and it is, what would be the impact of your recommendations on public lending institutions? Uh, Germany's economy relies uh, on a large network independ of independent public savings banks mm -hmm. uh, instead of state-level public banks. You've mentioned some of that. Uh, uh, and you've talked about the impact of the European Deposit Insurance Scheme um, on, on sort of Germany's particular setup and what it sees as its comparative advantage. Um, so how do, you, how do you see that issue? Yeah, so there are, um, 
there are a couple possible issues here. So one is that, I mean, it's it's probably just true that in a European deposit insurance scheme, German banks would be net contributors to the system, right? Uh, not only because their existing scheme is well-funded and that would kind of be ported up to the European Union, but also for a whole host of reasons, they tend to be much more conservative, partly because they're you know publicly, um, often kind of publicly owned or quasi-publicly owned entities. And so the reluctance in Germany towards a uh, European deposit insurance scheme is justified in the sense that they almost certainly would not be the ones benefiting from that. And it probably would, in fact, be, you know, Italy, Spain, Greece, that would be benefiting from the system. And the impact that would have on lending is maybe debatable. I mean, it's not like those banks would suddenly be uninsured, right? Like they would still have deposit insurance. They would probably still, like, if your deposit insurance fund is uh, larger than it needs to be, right? Like if it's overfunded, then you don't actually get any benefits from that. In fact, there's costs, right? Because you're paying into a system that you're not actually going to use. So you might see some efficiency benefits there. But really the problem would be if these institutions are incorporated into kind of mandatory bail-in schemes, and then suddenly they have to issue more capital, they have to um, issue riskier bonds, they have to fund themselves through different instruments. And so you could see a wind down of, uh, of lending or a slightly lower degree of lending um, among some of those local banks. But really the problem would be pretty minimal uh, relative to, to the benefits that it would provide to the whole Eurozone. So of course, yeah, there would be costs and obviously those banks would not necessarily want to pay them. Uh, but the idea that, you know, it would just turn into a situation where German banks are, are paying for sort of flippant Italian uh, lending it's like it's it's really not true. I mean, like no one's deliberately running their bank into the ground here. Um, so uh, so a lot of the the concern is is probably overblown, even if it is justified. Okay, well, I guess this issue of deposit insurance seems to have uh, sparked some interest. So I mean, we have a, a little different question now, um, which I guess would like you to drill down on uh, on this issue of why it's so important. Um, and the questioner says that you know there is a uniform legal level of protection for deposits of up to 100,000 euros in every European country, uh, and the question the, the the viewer, you know, emphasizes that France is one kind of centralized country, Germany is much more decentralized, um, and so maybe you really just need to have uh, you know different kinds of uh, deposit guarantees in each country. Um, and, and in fact, have deposit guarantee systems that are more tailored to the kinds of banks you happen to have in your country. I know you've covered this a lot, but I guess there, this, there is a lot of interest in this topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uniform coverage level is important, right? Because that didn't exist um, in uh, before 2008. And so you had, like, you had problems where the Irish government guaranteed all their bank deposits, and suddenly uh, people in other European countries pulled all their money out and put it in Irish banks. Um, and that's that's a problem. And so the uniform coverage is is a good start. So that has been harmonized, and that is definitely uh, an improvement. And it makes sense to have systems that are tailored to the local situation for banks that are exclusive to that country and for whose failure would not have significant spillover effects. Right. So in that respect, for some of these very small, you know, like so there are banks in Bavaria that like only exist in one town and they have like a very small amount of customers, right? So for that bank, it doesn't make sense to put it under European regulation with big European um, regulations. But a lot of these local banks are bigger than that, right? And even in Germany, right? You have kind of state level banks, you have broader banks that exist in multiple communities that spill over. And there you get into a problem of this creditor hierarchy that I mentioned. So to get kind of into the weeds here, the main sticking point is that some countries have a super preference for their deposit insurance scheme in recovery and a liquidation, and some countries do not. And this can create an issue where in countries like Germany, for example, the deposit insurance scheme gets paid out before anyone else does. And in other countries, that might not necessarily be true. And eventually you kind of gradually recuperate the deposit insurance fund through premiums on the other banks. And so when you have different hierarchies that exist for different countries, you can get into a problem where this public interest assessment that the single resolution board has to go through um, can produce results that are not actually optimal because depending on how many different countries the bank operates in, um, 
you can have a situation where it might be in the public interest to execute a resolution in one country and not execute it in another country. And then you get sort of a chaotic insolvency in one place and a resolution in some other place, and that destroys value. It creates broader spillovers, and it can lead to litigation after the fact, right? So if you have sort of a French citizen that has, you know, owns bonds in a, a German bank, and they get treated, treated differently from German bondholders, for example, then you have a, a pretty serious problem um, under European law and under the kind of idea that no creditor should be, be worse off. So even if breakups happen along national lines, the nature of European banking and the kind of lack of limits to, uh, to cross-border banking and to moving money across borders necessitates uh, a level of legal harmonization here to avoid those spillovers for these large banks. Um, even if this means that some countries are going to be slightly disadvantaged from what they have at present, or will have to adapt their banking systems in ways that, uh, that fit more closely to this European mold. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you need a German banking system that looks like France or a French banking system that looks like Germany. It just means maybe there needs to be a little bit of movement in both directions. Right. Um, you talked about moral hazard. Um, and, uh, and would I be, would I be um, going too far or maybe, let's say, being too, uh, being too pessimistic if I were to suggest that lis listening to what you had to say that it's better to work from the premise that moral hazard is always going to be with us rather than that we rather than uh, on the idea that there's a way to actually get rid of it or at least seriously ring fence it and and, and I and I guess one of the reasons that I asked that is uh, you know and if or rather if if it's if the case is it's sort of always going to be with us is that partly because because what you said about the distinction between institutional uh, capability on the one hand and political willingness on the other is that a big source of of moral hazard and and with and thus one one of the reasons we difficult to 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 hope that it could go away mm -hmm. yeah so that is a, a sort of major source is the idea that even in the context of having these sort of technical rules there are still incentives um, for countries to to bail out their banks and it's hard to get rid of those incentives but more broadly, the root of that moral hazard problem is just the size of the banks and the complexity and the fact they operate across borders. So in theory, if you break up the banks, that would solve the problem, right? But that seems so unlikely and probably not beneficial in a lot of respects that instead the next best option is to sort of recognize, okay, these institutions exist, they're gigantic, and they play this critical role in the economy, particularly and an increasingly critical role as the economy becomes more financialized and more globalized. And so in that respect, there has to just sort of be this accept, this understanding that these institutions, um, we can't just put them in an insolvency because we saw that in Lehman Brothers and it was a disaster. It was complete chaos and had these big major international spillovers. And so if putting them in bankruptcy like we would do with some other company is not an option, then we need some other alternative. And what we learned in 2008 is that sort of burying your head in the sand and pretending that we can, you know, imply that these institutions can be allowed to fail, um, it doesn't work. And, you know, even on a sovereign, you know, country level, right, the Germans learned this lesson in 2012 with the Greek bailout situation, right, that they can't pretend that this moral hazard problem doesn't exist and they can't pretend that they're not on the hook for it. And so the result is that you need to have mechanisms to ensure that, um, that A, you don't get into that problem in the first place through regulation, and that if you do get into that problem, you have ways of dealing with it that ensure that the people responsible suffer consequences, uh, whatever those consequences may be. Um, yeah, and we saw this in Credit Suisse, right? Like there was public money put up there, right? It wasn't, um, it wasn't a clean, smooth transition. They didn't follow the plan. But they did not, they didn't put up as much public money as they did when they bailed out UBS, for example, in, um, in 2008, right? And they triggered this bail-in, they imposed losses on their bondholders, uh, and the result is, you know, maybe not ideal, certainly not ideal, but it's better than what it could have been, right? The creditors suffered losses, and that's the way that this stuff should work. Um, so it's not great, but uh, it's certainly, certainly an improvement. Yeah. Thanks. Maybe perhaps one last question. And that is um, why, from a viewer, why is it a positive insurance scheme with its enormous moral hazard problems? Get back to that issue. 
more efficient than an institutional protection scheme? And doesn't the recent caving of U.S. banks suggest that there is actually a huge problem with traditional deposit insurance? And that is that's quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, that is um, that is an interesting uh, interesting question. So in Germany, uh, there are uh, there are these institutional protection schemes, particularly for these um, kind of small local banks, uh, Sparkerson. And uh, yeah, those exist to kind of keep the institution afloat. Um, the banks pay into them and um, and they get protected and that ostensibly protects depositors. And yeah, that could work for banks of that size, right? But when we think of what kind of institutional protection scheme would be necessary to insure JP Morgan, for example, then like that quickly becomes immensely costly. Right. And then if we think of one that would be big enough to protect JP Morgan and Citibank and Deutsche Bank and so on and so forth, then we we quickly get into something that is probably so costly that it's not actually worth uh worth the money. But the point about Silicon Valley Bank is is important here, right? That clearly we need to rethink um how deposit insurance functions in the wake of new technology, right? So in 2008, right, when when Northern Rock failed in this very classic bank failure in 2007. People lined up at the bank in the same way that they lined up in the 1930s, right? You had to go to the bank and get your money out. And that takes time, right? Days, weeks for a bank to die. But that doesn't exist anymore, right? Social media and online banking have killed that. Uh, if I wanted to pull my money out of my bank, I could do it before this webinar ends. And... <laughs> Uh, and if I wanted to go find the latest rumors, I don't need to pull up you know, Bloomberg and wait until they discuss it. I can go on Twitter and I can find rumors that are probably untrue, uh, probably blown out of proportion. And that creates a serious vulnerability. Silicon Valley Bank didn't die in weeks. It died in days. Uh, and so there, the kind of traditional idea of deposit insurance becomes something that we need to rethink. And institutional protection schemes are maybe an option. Um, for these regional banks, I mean, the U.S. government essentially did do that with Silicon Valley Bank. But yeah, when we think about how that would work for a BNP Paribas or something, like we quickly get into an amount of money that is probably just untenable. And instead having banks pay into uh, a fund or forcing them to kind of collateralize after the fact um, lending, because then you make institutions responsible for each other, right? If you have to bail out one bank, and then you have a legal mechanism that essentially forces the other banks in that country to pay for it after the fact, um, which is, tends to be how these things work. And that is probably more effective than an institutional protection scheme. Well, William, thank you very much. That was fantastic. I really appreciate your uh, your insights into the uh, some of the tensions uh, that, that are inherent in trying to trying to making trying to make a successful banking union in, in the European level, and also these the tensions uh, that exist between sort of technocracy and politics on the one hand, but also kind of national, European, global, and when you look when you look at this issue. So uh, we'll all stay tuned to see to see uh, where, where things go. Um, so thanks also to the, the viewers uh, for joining us and we hope that you will um, uh, tune into our next uh, next webinar. We have one in fact next week and hope you'll be able to join us. You can find all that on, on our website. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Great. Thank you.